Good morning. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, that you would love us so much that knowing before you even created mankind that you would have to send your son to die for us. Lord, we thank you for your love and your compassion, your mercy, your grace. Father, help us not to take lightly our salvation, but to live with a joy that has been established in our hearts through Jesus Christ, with the urgency that he may return at any point in time, and with a mission that we are the hands and feet of Jesus to, the, to a world that is hurting, that is lost without knowing Jesus. Father, help us to live our lives according to your will and your purpose, not our own. Empower us by your spirit to live. And Father, help us to see the opportunities that we have daily and know that you'll even give us the words to say to be a light to, to others. Help us not to quarrel, as the scripture says, among each other, but to be united with one another in love. And we just thank you and praise you for the love that you have given us, that you would send your son to die for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. So this week you should have read in your reading schedule for um, August, got to think what month this is, it's just flying by, is here. And we're reading 1st and 2nd Corinthians is where we're going. You should have already got into 1st Corinthians this week. We read Luke chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 24. If you read Luke chapter 25, you went too far. Okay, because there is no Luke 25. And then we began 1st Corinthians. And you know, I haven't read in this process, but... Man, 1 Corinthians is just falls perfect after what you've read in Luke. Because here you've got all these teachings that Luke has taught us. He wrote this so that we would know what we believe. He wrote in an orderly fashion. He put, presented God's word that way. The parables and such are not necessarily written chronological or anything else. They're written in a way from a mindset of a doctor explaining this process to you. And... Then here we get this church that Paul visited and spent a year and a half there um, with the people telling them about Jesus Christ. And now he's left, and I don't know how long it's been, we don't know exactly, but he has to write <clears throat> this letter back to the church because some in Chloe's household have said there are divisions in the church. And the reason that there are divisions is plain and simple. You hadn't got rid of the garbage out of your life. We want to hold on to the things of this world. It's not the problems that come. The problems are a result of man's heart, the sinfulness that's still there. Even if you are saved, if you're clinging to the things of this world, then you're not clinging to Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about, you know, like when you're climbing a rock wall or something like that. If you get distracted and you're not clinging to that rope, where are you going to wind up? And so many times in our lives, we look at the things that's going on, we listen to the, the wisdom of the world, we get our eyes fixed on things, or we long and look back like Lot's wife did, instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus. And that's tough because we can't see Jesus in this world. Yes, we can. We should see Jesus right here in each and every one of us. That's why there can't be any division or anything. If the church is united, division will end, plain and simple. If we are clinging to Jesus Christ, fixing our eyes on Him, we'll understand our mission, our purpose, and the rest will kind of fade away. You'll pay attention to that rope you're climbing, that you're walking by faith, and not pay attention to the distractions and the things that are fighting and going on around you. Beware that we're fighting a spiritual battle each and every day. And the devil is waging war against your soul. But if you're saved and he can't have your soul, he's certainly going to make sure that he makes you ineffective in leading others to salvation. Remember that. So in chapter 22, the first thing we read was about this guy named Judas. And... My <clears throat> In one of the Bible versions I read, it's, the header was the plot to kill Jesus. This Bible that I'm reading, and I thought that this one was a little different, it says Judas becomes an enemy of Jesus. And I pondered on that title. And these are titles, these aren't words of the Bible, but they're titles that's put in there to help us understand. And I thought, you know, we're all enemies of God. 
But because of faith in Jesus Christ, we become friends. Why would we ever want to live, as Paul says, still as an enemy of Christ? Whenever we're not living every word that Jesus Christ says, and it is a daily, hourly, minutely battle. I don't know if minutely, is that a word? Okay, I didn't think it was. I was uh, pondered on that. Every minute, every second, we're fighting that spiritual battle. And we need to remember that we are to live like Jesus. Even Jesus' words were to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. We tend to forget about the Old Testament because we're under the New Testament, the New Covenant, written in the blood of Jesus Christ. We're living in an age of grace. But God's holy standard is still the same. We enter into the Holy of Holies every single day because we <clears throat> come to God through Jesus Christ. But think back of all the requirements in the Old Testament and how the high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies one time a year to make atonement for sins. We can come every single day. What a privilege, what an honor. Are you living like that? We should be living 365 and a quarter times better than the high priest did in that day. Because we go every single day into the presence of God. We've seen His love become manifest in Jesus Christ, His only Son. Things that the Old Testament saints never even imagined that God would love us so much that He'd give His Son to die for us. So are we living out this gospel message or are we distracted by the things of this world? Are you a friend of Jesus? Or are you living as his enemy? And I didn't say his enemy. I said living as his enemy. Because I'm assuming that you're saved and you know Jesus as your Savior. Judas will forever be remembered as a traitor. He's remembered as one of the twelve disciples, but he's remembered as the traitor. And you want to make somebody mad, you get in an argument with them and you say, you Judas, you. You don't hear it as much as you used to, but the world knows what that means. The church knows what that means. That means you are a traitor. You are a terrible, terrible person. But Judas got a bad rap, in my opinion. Don't throw rocks at me yet. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus called him by name. He gave up everything to follow Jesus at least appeared to be. He let Satan enter into him. So did Peter at the same time. Both of them thought they would never, ever betray Jesus the Christ. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. Problem. They both held on to the world. Both. But Peter truly repented. Where Judas was simply remorseful, there's a big difference. And I'm glad Walt's here. He can probably tell me what the differences in the words are because there's a little difference in the word used for repentance of Judah compared to repentance that shows that you have truly changed your mind, which has changed your heart. The one says you feel sorry. Maybe we'll call that a guilty conscience. The other says you're convicted by the Holy Spirit. Your mind has changed and now you're being transformed through and through so that you can present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service. Which is the transformation, the same word used for Jesus Christ when he was transfigured before the disciples' eyes. Judas, this close from everyone in here, that one day something will come into your life that causes you to become a traitor to Jesus. The difference is, when it comes to you, just like it did with David and the atro atrocities that he committed, when he realized what he did, he said, Father, I have sinned against you. Only against God have I sinned. Please forgive me. Do you realize what God has done for you. Do you thank Him? Do you love Him? And when the time comes that there are diversities and trials in your life, when you say, why, Lord? 
How far are you from doing what Judas did? That's why I say he's got a bad rap. He walked and talked with Jesus. The other disciples didn't know him as a traitor till after the fact. They didn't know at that time. They didn't walk around and say, hey, that guy over there, he, he's not really one of us. He appeared to be one of the twelve. Jesus knew because Jesus knows your heart. But everyone else in the church out of the twelve thought G Judas was one of them until that day. What about his name? Let's look at his name for just a minute. There's so much that out there that are other gospels of Judas. Do you know there is another gospel of Judas? It was found in the 1970s. It's not a gospel that would have never been put, and maybe we'll do that as a Bible study one time, it would have never been put into the scriptures because it contradicts the other gospels. But it's a legitimate writing that was found, and it's, it's dated back to 100 or so A.D., but it literally says that Judas betrayed Jesus because Jesus asked him to do it so that he could be lifted up to heaven. That is a lie from the devil. Even if it's an old document, it is nothing but a lie. Because Scripture is clear and that goes against what Scripture says. Part of his name, Iscariot. That might mean that he came from the town of Korath. That might mean that he was not a Galilean where the others were, so he was an outsider. Maybe. Maybe that means that that's a close, the word is close to a word that is used a little later, a Latin word, for a rebel, and it means dagger. So maybe he was a traitor from the beginning. Well, let me tell you something. You're not a traitor from the beginning. Something changes in you that makes you become a traitor. No one just gets up and says, I'm going to betray everything. Something happens where that goes. We're going to close with a song a little bit called A Slow Fade. Because if you don't watch it, if you don't stand firm each and every day of your life, if you don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you don't realize when Jesus was being tempted and he was physically hungry, hungering to the point his body needed nourishment, and the tempter came to him and said, turn this, these stones into bread. And he replied, which is scripture. But Jesus replied, man cannot live by bread alone. But by every, every, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you can count on every word that God has said. You can look at the prophecy here that involved Judas as well. And you can count on every word that Jesus Christ said. So the words that you should be clinging to right now is, I will return for you. Are you ready? Are you doing what I left you here to do? Are you telling others about me? And the cool thing there is you don't even need to have the words to say. When the opportunity comes and you realize it, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. And don't beat yourself up afterwards. I do that quite often. I should have said this. I should have said that. <laughs> and then it comes to me, you know what? I said exactly what God gave me to say. Leave it at that. And if it's Jesus saved, Jesus loves me, this I know, whatever it is, then those words were absolutely perfect. What happens is when I come in and start putting my own words in there so many times, that's when I need to learn to keep my mouth shut, right? I'm looking. <laughs> What about Simon the Zealot, if you want to put those into Judas? Simon the Zealot was a riotous man that wanted to bring about the, the end of the Roman occupation by blood. We don't hear about him much, but we hear about Judas. Because of what he did, because his relationship wasn't right with the Lord. So anyway, I just wanted to point those out, not to go down too much of a rabbit trail, because if you start studying about Judas, you'll get all these different thought processes in there. Judas was one of the 12 disciples that Jesus called. But he looked back longingly at this earth till Satan entered him, and there's nothing special about that word, 
<clears throat> Luke 6, 8, 6, 16 is the first time that we hear about Judas. Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Maybe we just have Judas Iscariot to associate him differently from the other 12. Sometimes it's simple. You don't have to worry about it. They were both one of the 12. Luke doesn't mention him again until chapter 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12s. That's all the information we have. That word simply means Satan came to him. It doesn't mean he possessed him or anything else. It means on that day when the timing was right, Satan came and said, Hey, Alan, do this instead of following after God. What can you get for turning Jesus in? You thought he was coming to bring about the end of Roman occupation and this isn't what's happening. Maybe he's not really who he says he is. So many people walked away in the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So many that Jesus had to ask the 12, are you going to leave me also? But Peter did reply. He said, there's no way we can leave you. You are the Son of God. You have the words of life. And Jesus came back and said, This wasn't given to you by man. This information was given to you by God. And he goes on to pray for the disciples and pray for the disciples. E even where we're reading here, he prays that, that Peter won't be sifted by the devil. So I want to look at a few other Gospels before we go much further. I'm going to go to John chapter 12 if you want to look there. Because this kind of is what sets up the stage for Judas' betrayal of Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the hometown of Lazarus, who, <clears throat> whom he had raised from the dead. They hosted a dinner for Jesus there. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him, asked, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to take from, from what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. She has kept this perfume in preparation for the day of my burial. The poor will always have you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews learned what, that Jesus was there, and they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. Now, the reason I wanted to go all the way to Lazarus was to tell you about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. It came true. Lazarus came back and told the people, here's a dead man that now lives, that stinketh. That's what the Bible says. He stinketh because he had been dead four days. No doubt he's dead. And he comes back from the dead to tell people that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's sitting there reclining with him. And what do the Pharisees say? If only you could bring back someone from the dead, my brothers would believe. No, they didn't. Judas was having doubts at this point. And he said that that was wasteful, what she did. And Jesus said, no, it wasn't. It was lavish, and I appreciate it. But Judas wasn't the only one that felt that way. Do you realize that? Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 14. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were two days away. I just read six days away. Hmm, scratch our heads. And I want you to learn. I want you to study God's Word. And there are different answers here. My answer is it's two different anointings. That's my answer simply. Okay, Jesus taught about the same topic at different times. Different people came in and anointed him. No big deal. It's easy to explain that. Whether that's true or not, it's easy to explain that it's not a discrepancy. 
And the chief priests and scribes were, were looking for a covert way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Now, either this is a different account, or like I said, this is the same account, but we've got a contradiction of days. While Jesus was in Bethany, okay, we got Bethany again, reclining at, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. Okay, another either discrepancy or this points even more that it's the same place. The first one said that they hosted a dinner. I'm assuming Mary and Martha because it said it was at their home. Okay. A woman came with an alabaster jar. A woman could be Mary, but it looks like this is a different time. Of expensive perfume made of pure nard again. Same thing. She broke open the jar and poured it on Jesus' head. The other said Jesus' feet. Oh, well, she could pour it on his head and his feet. That easily explains this, but I'm still going with two separate incidents, whether you do or not. So I'm going with two. Some of those present... Some of those present, however, expressed their indignation to one another. Not just to Jesus, but to one another. Did you see? Hey, Terry, did you see? I've never been guilty of that. Have you? <laughs> did you see what that woman did? First of all, do you know who that woman is? We're missing the whole point of the love and adoration that she had for Jesus let alone possibly the spiritual that she had of anointing Jesus for his coming burial, for his death. Some of those present, however, expressed their indignation to one another, and they said, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for 300 denarii, same amount of money. It didn't just come from Judas's mouth. John is writing because it did, because he's making the point that it came from Judas's mouth. But it came from each other's mouths also. Judas might have been the one that said it out loud. We don't know. It could have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. Not just Judas. They scolded the woman for what she did. Okay, let's go look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, okay, we're starting off the same as Mark. And Mark and Matthew's Gospels are, are pretty much the same. A lot more information, different uh, audiences they're writing to, different purpose, but they're very similar. Verse 7, A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as she reclined at the table. When the, not just others, but the disciples saw this. Okay, maybe before you thought it was the Pharisees in the crowd. When the disciples saw this, and that's going to imply anyone who was a disciple, but it is also going to imply the twelve. When they saw this, they were indignant. And let me explain what that word means because it was in the last one, just in case you don't know. It means sorely displeased with this action. Oh, it grates my nerves that this woman would come in here and do this. Especially while we're eating this meal. How dare she? The scornful indignation that we sometimes have for others. Mm. And they ask, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus asked, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful deed to me. The poor will always have you the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Now the reason I stopped here on this one is because the poor are very significant in this story. The poor are very significant if you didn't understand it in Luke's gospel. It does not mean poor monetarily. It means poor in this world because of an affliction, because of the situation they're in. The uh, demon, not possession, but oppression that's in their lives. The pig pen that they've put themselves into. The pig pen that someone else has put them into. Just the fact they're born in some third world country and don't have the privileges that we have. The poor in this world, as opposed to the rich 
in this world. You are so rich, so blessed. Those things are given to you by God so that you can be rich to others. Not monetarily, maybe monetarily, but it has nothing to do when it says that we can't serve both God and money, it doesn't mean just monetarily. It means where your heart is focused, there will be your uh, loyalty, who you serve. And it's so easy to get caught up in this country with me, myself, and I. I call that the unholy trinity, if you haven't heard me say that before. Because it's the three that's waging war against the holy trinity. And I wage it all the time. And half time don't even know it. So three points I want to make here before I go on. The disciples, probably all of them, had the exact same reactions that Judas had. And out of their mouths, their mouths, came what was in their heart. Don't give Judas just the bad rap on this because he's equal with all of them. Judas takes the blame because of what he does. Okay, And what does he do? He chooses money over God, but they're doing the same thing. He chooses his position over their position. He says, I'm not as bad a sinner as they are, but every one of the disciples said the same thing. Second point I want to make here is, do you have a heart of compassion for the poor? How do you view them? Do you view them as their own fault many times because of the drug addiction that they have or whatever it is? I know you do. Don't lie, because I do. If you don't, then you're better than I am, for sure. Because my sinful flesh says they deserve it sometimes. I'm putting myself right where Jesus was at that table. Right where the other disciples were at that table. Am I rich in compassion? Because Jesus was rich in compassion. He gave up more than I could ever give up. He gave up heaven, and then he gave up his life. And he tells us no greater thing can a man do but to give up his life to save his friend. And we're supposed to follow in his footsteps. Third point I want to make is do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? I did it three times on purpose. You'll understand that in a little bit. As this much as this woman did, that you're not worried about humiliation, that you're not worried about the cost, you're not worried about the church pointing fingers at you? Do you love Jesus where nothing else matters? Your past? Nothing. Judas was not some bad guy. He was one of the twelve. He was called by Jesus. He answered the call. He was trained by Jesus. He received authority and power to cast out demons. He broke bread with Jesus and had communion with Jesus. But he looked back longingly at the world. Whatever it is that tempts any one of us, just as Satan came to Eve and tempted her. The devil is going to do his best to tempt you to make you ineffective for Jesus Christ if in fact you belong to him. Luke 22 verse 3, Then Satan entered Jesus, Judas Iscariot. He came along and tempted Judas and Judas fell. Matthew 26, verse 20 to 15. When evening came, Jesus was reclining with the twelve disciples, and while they were eating, he asked them, Truly I tell you, one of, one of you will betray me. They were deeply grieved and began to ask one another, Surely not I, Lord. They didn't have a clue that it was Judas at this point. Because he lived just like the rest of them. Verse 22, they were deeply grieved and began to ask one another, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Now Jesus is quoting scripture there, prophecy too, if you don't see this. God knows everything. And he will use you for his glory one way or the other. He used Judas for his glory. He used Pharaoh for his glory. 
He will use you for His glory. Let it be walking in the footsteps of Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 24, The Son of Man will go just will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. It would be better for him if he had not been born. I don't know where that scripture is talking specifically about Judas or not, but I think it's talking about me. I think it's talking about you. I think it's talking about anyone who turns his back and denies Jesus for whatever reason. It made me remember back to my childhood years where I knew better, I was far enough to, to know better. And getting into high school, I'd grown up in a Christian school, and then I started football games, meeting secular people and other things, getting distracted. And I remember people saying, do you go to that Christian school? No, I don't go there. No, I thought they were Jesus freaks, because I was ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I didn't know the power that it had for salvation. I didn't understand that. Was I saved? You better believe it. But did I deny Jesus? Yes, I did. Just like Judas, just like Peter. But I, like Peter, have come back and repented and said, not my will, but yours, Lord. Not was I just remorseful, but I wanted to live a life that brought honor and glory to God. And so I try to deny myself every single day, take up my cross and follow after Jesus. Verse 25 says, Then Judas, who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. I don't know how he meant that. I don't know what his thoughts were. I think he was wrestling with the flesh, just like I'm sure that we all have. Jesus answered, You have said it yourself. John 13, verse 18 to 29. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the Scripture. The one who shares bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens so that when it comes to pass, you will believe that I am he. Every word that comes from God, you can count on it. Those words were written by David 1,000 years earlier. <clears throat> truly, truly, I tell you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified. Truly, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. It hurt Jesus that Judas would betray him and not repent to salvation. He mourned for them just like he mourned for Israel. It is God's will that everyone will be saved, but it's our choice. And it doesn't matter how good you think you stand, how many works of righteousness that you have, it matters about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength? And if you do, you will have compassion, especially for the poor, especially for your brothers and sisters. Verse 22, The disciples looked at one another perplexed as to which of them He meant. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table. So Simon Peter motioned to him and asked Jesus which one, uh, which one he was talking about. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked, Lord, who is it? Now, John is the one who said that Judas was a thief, that he had been taking money from the money bag. He said that because he knew it after the fact. He did not know it at this point. He's co co conversing with Peter, who do you think it is? He didn't say, it's that Judas over there. Because Judas looked just like each and every one of us. But then something came along that he made a decision and he wound up in the mud and he never let Jesus pick him back up. <clears throat> Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this morsel after I have dipped it. Then he dipped the morsel and gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said to Judas, what, about, what you are about to do, do it quickly. But no one at the table knew why Jesus, why Jesus had said this to him. Since Judas kept the money back, some thought that Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor which is the very thing we read in the Scripture before that Judas said against. 
Because see, Jesus knew his heart, but we don't know someone's heart. So we've got to be iron that sharpens iron. We've got to be unity instead of division. We've got to be love instead of pointing fingers. Psalm 41.9 is what Jesus was quoting. Even my close friend whom I have trusted, the one who shared my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Now I want to point out something about that psalm. Do you know how that psalm begins? If anybody does hear, I'd love to hear it because you probably don't. And I don't expect you to because I didn't know this. And when I read God's Word and I see this, I'm like, wow! Psalm 41 begins this way. Blessed is the one who cares for the poor. Boy, that's ironic, isn't it? No. That's God and His sovereignty with the words that David wrote 1,000 years earlier about the Christ. Goes on to say, The Lord will deliver him in the day of trouble. If you are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, then there's your works that you're doing proving your repentance. Your love for your fellow man, including the poor and afflicted, because Jesus loves you. And you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. You think of yourself as a poor beggar begging at the table of the king for God's grace, His mercy to be poured out on you and equally on anyone and everyone else. Because we all deserve God's wrath. Throw Peter in here just so you can pair. Peter denied Jesus three times. Don't forget that. You didn't read it here. You can read it when you study the other Gospels. And each time that rejection of Jesus got worse. I mean, he wanted it to be known. He did not know or associate with that man called Jesus. Uh, that's pretty tough. But we don't point fingers and call Ju G uh, Peter, I'll get it out in a minute, a traitor. Because Peter was reinstated. Peter did trust, even though he looked longingly, even though he shot his mouth off, everything else that he did. He was used mightily by God. In Luke 22, verse 31 to 33, and let me point out this, Peter never thought he would betray Jesus. It was the furthest thing from his mind, but he did. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. Simon, Simon. Two times Jesus calls him by name. I can't imagine if you went Henry, Henry. Henry is my first name, and whenever I'm in trouble, I get Henry, come here. If I got Henry, Henry, I cannot even imagine. <laughs> but you would know that I better pay attention. Simon, Simon. What next? Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. Things haven't changed, guys. He still wants to sift you like wheat. <clears throat> I love this. It's one of those big buts. But I have prayed for you. Jesus, praying for me. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding, and I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me interceding. I need to concentrate on every word that Jesus says and live it. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, then strengthen your brothers. Lord, said Peter, I am ready to go with you even to prison and to death. No, he wasn't. Not at that point. But he would become that way. Now, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert, and I say that sometimes, and I hope you know what that means, but I'll clarify it so you know. That's like when you see the trailers to the movies and they show you all the good parts. You already know what's going to happen. Spoiler alert, as you read, not this week, but next week in 1 Corinthians, Paul's going to write these words. So I'm saying them now so that you read these words that Paul wrote to this Corinthian church. And you ask God to examine your heart and tell you if any of these things are in your life or if there's anything in your life that's keeping you from being like Jesus in this world. And if so, lay it at the feet of Jesus. Don't look back. Don't let it discourage you. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear you're not good enough or anything else. 
because you are good enough. Jesus died to save you and it was finished on that cross. And when he rose again on the third day, it gave us hope that we know that we will be resurrected with Jesus Christ. No matter what someone whispers in your ear. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. That's what Paul's writing to this church because they've let the world infect them instead of Jesus infect them. So back to what we read in Luke 22, verse 3, Then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, and Judas went to discuss with the chief priests and temple officers how he might betray Jesus to them. I don't know if he thought about that before or not, but he acted on his heart at that moment. And he said, let me go see what they'll give me, what I'll get. It's about me, myself, and I, right? What will I get if I betray Jesus? They're looking for some covert way. They don't need me. They know who Jesus is. But maybe I can profit out of this deal. <clears throat> they, the chief priests, were delighted and agreed to give him money. Not power, not prestige, but what his heart was. Remember back to the parable, well not the parable, but the story of the rich man that came and Jesus said, go sell everything, even though he'd kept all the commandments. No, I'm not willing to do that. Jesus, Judas was not willing to give God everything, which makes me have to question myself. Am I willing to give him everything? What about the thing that comes in my life that keeps me this close from being Judas? I need to pray that my strength, my faith is strengthened. I need to hunger and thirst for righteousness, consume God's word. I need to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the poor. Not talk about it, but do it. Verse 6, Judas consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them in the absence of a crowd. Now Matthew says this to go put a little more light on the subject. Matthew 26, 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? And they set out, we get the amount, 30 pieces of silver. So from then on, Judas looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now I don't know if you know this, or if you thought about this, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. The word that is used for, for 30 pieces of silver here is not the same word used for the denarii. But they mean the same thing. They're two different words. They simply mean money, coinage, silver. They could have been exactly the same thing. Now you might do more studying and show me something differently, but the scripture's not specific on it was a $20 U.S. bill with the face of, who's on the 20? Jackson? I don't know if I got that right or not. Is that right? Thank you. But got more in here than I thought was still in here. <laughs> it was money. One was 300, one was 30. You think Judas ever thought he would take 10% of what the woman was willing to pour out on Jesus' head and feet, and maybe another woman was willing to do? Women. Property in that day. Scandalous woman, at least one of them, maybe both of them. But they were willing to give Jesus 300 pieces of silver. Judas took 30 pieces of silver. You think he thought that day would ever come? You think that day that the, the lost son thought he would have wound up in that pig pen? We never, ever think that way. Most of the times we think too highly of ourselves and we better be careful unless we fall. <clears throat> Don't say that you'll never betray Jesus. Peter and Judas both did. They walked with Jesus for three plus years. They received power enough to cast out demons. We're excited about it. They read and studied the scriptures more than we do. 
They knew that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. John the Baptist had to ask, are you the one or not? Because Satan is fighting and waging a war with each and every one of us. Be careful. But Peter repented. Here's what Matthew goes on in chapter 27 to say about Judas. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I'm reading the King James Version now because your version probably doesn't have repented. That's why I picked the King James. Saying, I have sinned and I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See, that, see thou to that. And he cast down the 30 pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But if you study that scripture, you'll see that that word repent is a proper, a proper word to use, but it doesn't have the change of mind that comes to the change of heart. And out of our heart comes our words and our actions. So dear brother and sister, whenever you see a word come out of your heart that's not like Jesus, get on your knees and ask for forgiveness. Because the further you go down that road, down the wrong path, the further that you're off the path of righteousness. Is Jesus the love of your life? What about money? You know, we were talking just a little bit Friday night about retirement, and it's not a biblical principle. <laughs> I'm not saying not to do it, but we're supposed to trust in the Lord. You cannot love both money and God. You will serve one or the other, so be careful. It was way back in Jesus' first real teaching in Matthew, verse, chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one. Boy, whenever I read that, it just... Hate? But that's what Jesus says. You will hate the one and love the other, because that is the opposite. It's black or white, heaven or hell. It's saved or not saved. It's living for Jesus or living a lie. There is no in-between. Either you will hate the one and love the other, you will be devoted to the one or despise the other. You cannot love God and money. And one day, one day, whether it's in this lifetime or it's when you pass, you will be exposed for your love of Jesus Christ or not. Where is your heart focused? What if Satan picked the right thing to whisper in your ear today? Here's what went through Judas's mind because it was what was in his heart, in my opinion. I will follow Jesus. I'll follow Jesus most of the time. I'll follow Jesus some of the time. Today I betrayed Jesus. What have I done? It's a slow fade. I told you we were going to get to this song. When black and white turn to gray. This is the truth. You either follow it or you don't. Jesus is either Lord of your life or He's not.